Hey, it's Jason here. A quick announcement in this episode, we are talking about psychedelic retreats and I am sharing my experience from going on one. This is not medical advice. This is not something I am recommending. I am merely sharing my experience. There are, of course, risks involved with this type of activity. Psychedelic compounds are illegal in most countries and you have to do your own due diligence. This is not an endorsement. This is merely sharing my experience for educational and informational purposes. Thank you for listening. Now, on to the show. What a lovely voice that is Do Paro, a.k.a. Sonia Kreitzer, who is my guest today. She was one of the facilitators at the psychedelic retreat I attended through Beckley Retreats. And I thought the best way to unpack this entire experience and why it was valuable for me was to invite somebody who was there who was a facilitator on the show. And that's what Sonia is doing today. She's been so kind and generous to answer my many questions about how travel impacted her life, what led her to working with plant medicine, and some of her personal experiences around that. And then we flip the script, and she helps me to pull out some of the big lessons learned from this week. Of course, you'll hear more detail about the experience itself during the ceremonies, as well as some of the other big takeaways. And this is kind of different for me. I'm not usually on this side of the mic sharing my experience in this way, but I'm excited to do that with you today. So hope you're ready for it. It's going to be a fun one. Buckle up, strap in. Thanks for being here. And welcome to the Zero to Travel podcast, my friend. You're listening to the Zero to Travel podcast, where we explore exciting travel-based work, lifestyle, and business opportunities, helping you to achieve your wildest travel dreams. And now your host, world wanderer and travel junkie, Jason Moore. Hey there, it's Jason with ZeroToTravel.com. Welcome to the show, my friend. Thanks for hanging out, letting me bring a little travel into your ears today. This is the show to help you travel the world on your terms to fill your life with as much travel as you desire, no matter what your situation or experience. Thanks so much for being here. If you're still here, I suppose you are interested in this topic or at least curious to hear what my experience was like. Perhaps you've done this before, perhaps not. Either way, you heard the disclaimer at the top. This is not medical advice. This is not a recommendation for you or anyone else to do this. And this is not something you should take lightly. You have to do your own due diligence. I am merely here to share my experience, which you'll hear in a moment. First, I do want to give you a background on how this episode came to be with the intention of giving you some things to consider if your interest happens to be piqued after this show. First and foremost, of course, I was thinking about my safety Can I handle the ingestion of these compounds, psilocybin mushrooms? What are the risks? What are potential benefits? Is it worth it for me to try this out? And so on. So that's one piece. And then the other huge piece is, of course, the people involved who create the frameworks and the container in which I was going to have an experience of self-exploration. And what was the group going to be like? How were the people going to facilitate this? That's a lot of responsibility. And like any industry, field, business, You're going to have a variety of options to choose from, and you're sure to encounter qualified experts along with people who maybe mean well but aren't qualified and should not be in the space, maybe opportunists, perhaps even criminals or those taking advantage of others. So like anything else, if you're going to dive into this type of experience, you're going to want to do some research and choose wisely. In fact, my friend Paige McClanahan, she's the host of the Better Travel podcast and also a New York Times journalist. She sent me over a New York Times article recently that was titled, What Does Good Psychedelic Therapy Look Like? And they talked about this exact thing that psilocybin and MDMA treatments are becoming more mainstream. But they say, quote, the therapy component has come under scrutiny 
And that makes sense. Of course, this is a powerful experience and you want to have the right type of people involved to help guide you through it and get the most out of it. And I must say, when Beckley Retreats reached out, originally their intention was just to see if they could have Neil, who you heard in the last episode, their CEO, as a guest on the podcast. But when I started doing research, learning about what they offered, reading about the ongoing science-backed research they were doing with psychedelic therapy through the Beckley Foundation, and I checked out the team and saw the level of professionalism of the staff and the program, I just... I don't know, in a in kind of a, a moment of sort of, let's just see what happens. I just fired off an email and said, hey, what do you think if I come on this and share the experience? Can, can we maybe figure something like that out? And to my surprise, they said yes. And this was an incredible opportunity because for me, I felt like this was the ideal situation to try something like this. And this is something I've been wanting to do. And I do want to be clear that they did fly me down there and they covered the retreat. And other than that, there were no requirements on what I could or could not share. I just said, I just want to share my experience with this. And uh, that was that was the deal. So I'm very fortunate. I've always wanted to do this type of thing with the podcast where I can go and actually have an experience and share it with you and share it honestly. And I have to say, honestly... Beckley had an incredible top-notch staff. They were experienced, professional, educated, talented, so kind. They did an amazing job of just guiding us through this whole process. And I loved the program and how it's structured because you have four weeks before you even go of front-end sort of self-exploration. There's an app and you go through this whole program. It's great information, but it's not overwhelming. You have calls where you meet as a group prior to arrival so you already kind of feel connected with people and then you have the one week retreat which includes the yoga and the guided meditations and the breath work and the two psilocybin ceremonies along with time in nature awesome food they had an incredible group of people so they obviously have a great vetting process everybody there was was so nice and we really gelled as a group and then afterwards you have six weeks of integration they call it which is post retreat you are trying to pull out the key lessons you learned from the experience and then figure out ways you can implement them into your life to create lasting change. So it's really powerful. And I'm in that process now and there's been a lot of journaling. We have these group calls and really just trying to figure out how to integrate these lessons into my life. And I'll talk a bit about that during the interview with Sonia. And I'll also on the back end share one of the things I'm most proud of so you can stick around for that but shall we get into it i think it's time (laughs) thanks for listening to this here's my chat with sonia who's going to help me unpack this whole experience and you'll also get to hear a bit about her story which is pretty incredible so i hope you enjoy it thanks for listening and i'll see you on the other side my friend Sonia Kreitzer, welcome to the Zero to Travel podcast, my friend. <laughs> Thank you. Very happy to be here. I'm honored that you said yes. As people have just heard, this is sort of the follow-up to the first episode we did about this. And then this one is going to be about my experience actually doing it, which I've always kind of wanted to do like the gonzo journalism thing, I guess they call it. Like you, you don't just write or talk about the thing, you actually live it. But I've also been really curious about this for a long time. And you were, well, we'll get into like your work and what you do and things like that. But you were, you know, one of the the lead facilitators during this, these ceremonies, these psilocybin ceremonies. Anyway, going into this, I was like, how am I going to record this episode? Who's going to help me like sort of unpack all this? And then you were so generous to say, to say yes. And it's so interesting for me because you're on the other side facilitating these things. So anyway, thank you so much for taking the time. Yeah. Thank you for inviting me on. So I wanted to hear a bit more about your life and your experience because I think this obviously is going to lead to some of the work you're doing today. Just through some of my research, it sounds like you've had quite a few interesting travel experiences of your own. <laughs> you grew up on the East Coast. We talked about that a bit when we were in uh, in the Netherlands. You're from upstate New York area? 
Yes. I'm from Syracuse originally. Okay. Do you have any siblings or? I do. I have a younger sister and a younger brother. Okay. And were you playing music at a fairly young age or? Yeah, I was definitely always really musical and I actually made a record when I was in high school, my first record. So it was always something I was kind of gravitating towards. Did you have a, a supportive environment for kind of going on like the path of a, an artist, let's say? I did. I mean, it, it was interesting because like living in Syracuse, you don't see anyone who's necessarily doing that. It's not something that was modeled for me. Um, yeah, no one in my family was in the music industry or really super musically oriented. So it was definitely a path I had to carve out myself. But in general, I think my family was really supportive of the arts and my grandmother was a, a painter. So there was a little bit of that in the, in the family line. When you're growing up, sometimes it's, it just takes one adult to say the right word or encourage you or do something that makes you think, Oh yeah, that, that can be like a thing. But I mean, you said you didn't have that modeled for you necessarily right around you, but did you have some other people around you that were like some big influences on you growing up that kind of kept you going on this path or? For sure. And I think what you said is so true. It's like, if we don't know something exists, but we have a feeling it does, we are like constantly searching for breadcrumbs. Um, and that might come in, in just in terms of something somebody says or like, or somebody who kind of directs you towards like a particular way of thinking. And I, I definitely had a lot of adults around me who were self-reflective and just definitely like within my family, the the model of follow your heart was a big one. And I think that can be enough sometimes. That's nice. Yeah. Particularly with the heart. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> totally. And particularly with the, the art is such a path of the heart. So maybe that was a strong enough soil to grow out of. And, but getting into the music business, you have the, the heart side and then the business side, right? Those, those uh. two things can <laughs> conflict at some, some points, I would guess. You're pursuing music, you're doing it for your passion. Was there a point where you were like, you know, I actually want to do this professionally. Like, this is what I want to do. Did you make a, decision at some point was a decision point for you or was it just sort of an organic kind of let me keep making things and doing things yeah it was definitely ambitious and I didn't know how it was going to happen but I was like I want to make a career of this I want to have records um I was like obsessed with all those big uh like big voices uh that I grew up with in the late 80s like Mariah Carey and Whitney Houston and and obviously, that was a very different era of the music business than the one I entered in in the late like aughts, essentially. Um, but yeah, at, at some point, I was like, I'd love to find the way to transition into making this a career. And I moved to New York City and was playing out in clubs and kind of working um, like what was known at that time as kind of like the indie circuit in between like Brooklyn and New York City. Yeah. I used to be a tour manager for a band that was in Brooklyn. It was cool because we would come back from tour and, you know, crash there and their practice space was there and everything. You know, sometimes a scene is like hidden and you, you hear about it later, you know, and sometimes there's just like an evident scene and like the whole indie thing in Brooklyn at that time was just like, evidently there's some energy, there's some, incredible art coming out of this area right now. Like it was just there. What a cool place to be. Yeah, totally. I, I, it is true. It's like, you don't always know a moment is happening till it's past, but I felt in this case, it was tangible. There's so much good music coming out in this particular time and in, in Brooklyn. For somebody that's listening that maybe wants to pursue, I wouldn't call like pursuing music unconventional or whatever, but it depends on how, what somebody's standards are, you know, or what their family standards are, the pressures they get from other people. But if, if somebody's listening and they, they want to pursue something that's maybe an alternative path or, or something, it's not like, you know, the office job or whatever. How important do you think it is to kind of get into, to put your physical body into those types of 
environments where a lot of people are, are creating or you're around the thing that's happening? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. And I think it's never been more of like an open question than it is now. And virtual spaces are so available to us. Like, you know, it's very different, this answer in 2023 than it would have been in 2003. Like in 2003, I would say it's essential. You need to. And also just for the sake of seeing evidence of it in the world, of being like, this is a path that is, people are on it. People who maybe are, are similar to me in certain ways that I can identify with. But now it's so interesting because, you know, you have YouTube stars who have never toured, um, who have never actually performed a show, but are really famous and their music is out there in the world. And um, yeah, I have friends all the time in LA who are like backing up these artists um, who have actually never played before live, but have massive following. So <laughs> it's totally like open field, I think, in terms of how you how you crack into it at this point. How much does the environment you're in when you're, if you're writing a song, how much does the, the environment impact the song? Do you think? So my, I mean, for me, I'm really sensitive to spaces and, um, I noticed my songwriting got a bit different when I moved out to California. I noticed my songwriting is very different when I'm writing in Costa Rica. Like it's so inspired by the land and, and the culture you went traveling alone through the Himalayas. Can you tell us about that time in your life and what brought you there and, and just a bit about the journey? It was such a profound um, moment in my life and, and time period because I was, um, I went there, I had been pursuing music as a career for like four years in New York after college and was not having any of the the green lights to keep continuing. I was waitressing and um, just like things were not going well <laughs> with my band. And I had kind of come to the conclusion that it was time to like hang up that dream and sort of move on. And I'd always wanted to go to India. And I was like, you know, maybe I'll get my yoga teacher training. That's something I wanted to do. I didn't really know what to do as it goes when things sort of naturally fall apart in our lives. It's like you're in that period of what's next. And again, I was just breadcrumbing. I was like, okay, yoga teacher training. I've always wanted to go to India. And I really went there with the intention of making peace with giving up pursuing music. And I think what I learned from that experiment (laughs) is that, you know, if if something's really meant to be, it's going to keep coming back to us and, and we don't have to always chase it. Like our, our path finds us as much as we find our path. So, um, yeah, I spent the first few months in India studying yoga and traveling around and just kind of letting myself not have a plan for the first time. And then in the fourth month I was there, I, um, I wanted to go to, uh, McLeod Ganj, which is where the Dalai Lama lives. I wanted to visit the Dalai Lama temple. I was planning to be there for two or three days. And while I was there, I was on a hike with a friend and we got lost on the way back and heard this amazing singing. And I was like, can we actually just follow that voice? I've never heard anything like that. And we ended up at the Tibetan Institute for Performing Arts, which uh, was the singing that I was hearing with this Tibetan opera. And that's how I found how, found that about Tibetan opera. And I asked um, the teacher there if he would teach me. And he was like, I will, I don't teach people who don't sing already. And I was like, well, I sing. And he was like, okay, the agreement I'll make with you is I'll teach you one song, um, but you have to stay a minimum of 30 days and study with me every day to learn that one song. And then we can see, go from there. And that's how I began studying. Wow. It sounds like something out of a movie. (laughs) It's really crazy. And it was such a cliche because Eat, Pray, Love had just been made into a movie at the time. And I was like, I feel like I'm living... uh, my own version of it in a way I don't want to be, <laughs> but do. And um, yeah, something in the way Tibetan opera singing works is it's in such a high octaves that it like really taught me to move my voice and to access parts of my voice I didn't even know existed. And after that period of study was when music started to flow for me from a really different space. Can you describe that space? Yeah. Um, 
is so clear to me now. Before I went and studied uh, Lamo is what's called Tibetan opera singing. I was singing, I, when I was writing, I was like chasing music. I was like pushing for it. I was trying to find songs. I, and I think this happens a lot when you're early stages of an artistic career is you're imitating other people, but you're not necessarily finding your signature. I think that's it's a stage on the path to finding your your own thing. Um, and after I got back, I was like, oh, I could just like see, hear, find, write the song of my life in every moment I was in. Um, I was in a totally like transportive state of inspiration. I'd, I'd be on the subway and hear a conversation and start writing. I, I, the songs were just like flowing. Um and it was wild to me. It was unprecedented in my life. So you spent 30 days there or did you stay longer? I think I ended up staying six weeks there. And then I start, and, and I developed a relationship with um, my teacher and started coming back like every other year. Okay. For, and, and so it was like a multi-year study and continues to be. Wow. I guess outside of what you just described with with your voice and the songwriting and what you discovered there. What has this taught you about yourself studying Lamo? Is it called mm -hmm. being around that form of music and being there and learning it? Like what else did you take from that experience? I mean, it was so hum genuinely like just flattening, humbling. Like there's so many art forms out there. There's so many ways to use the voice that I don't know. Just like um, really being so awed by this lineage, um, the way that culture is being preserved through these songs, the the voice, the angelic voicing of it, and um, the idea that there are ranges of our voice that we are not even using, um, that that may be cultural, like we may be culturally singing from a lower place um, than other cultures do. And um, I realized that there's so little actually I know about the voice and music from studying there. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So it's just East meets West, I guess. And <laughs> mm -hmm. so yeah. Uh, yeah. I think that was my first like genuine encounter with indigenous wisdom in that way. So cool. I mean, it's amazing that you, that you got lost and you just followed a voice. It sounds very romantic in many ways you know it's just like <laughs> i know <laughs> I, I like used to when i would talk about this i'd be like i know this isn't going to sound real but <laughs> right it's right real. <laughs> <laughs> and after that did you continue <laughs> traveling for a while through through the region or after that i came home i had such a strong hit i was like it's time to create my my cup is overflowing right now and it's just the time um and i had like i got back i had no money i picked up a job um at like a summer camp i used to work at and and i left i was there for three days and left immediately i was like i have to just be alone for a bit and write like this i don't know how long this energy is gonna last for this creative thing that's happening inside of me and i didn't know because i never had it before so i was like i just want to honor whatever is coming through and and work with that. Yeah. Okay. So it was, was this where sort of the shift to, I, I know, and I'm just using your words on your website, which we'll, we'll link to your artist name, Do Pauro, song carrier and song healer. I love that. Mm -hmm. Is, do you think the, the, the song healer aspect of it kind of, was this the genesis of, of sort of that, direction i guess that embodiment i'm not sure how you want to maybe i think it took like 10 years to grow into that i think first like the after getting back from it might have been like unconsciously the the foundation for it but it was like 10 years of kind of pursuing a more conventional indie music path oh yeah okay and resisting resisting maybe the other part that was inevitable <laughs> Have you had a mystical experience before? Uh, definitely. Yeah, like many. <laughs> okay. Are you willing to share uh, a little bit? Yeah, sh sure. I can, I can share. Um, you know, on that same trip to India, um, there was 
I had heard about, uh, there was like a day of the week where you could go receive a blessing from this, um, high, um, Tibetan monk He's called the Karmapa. I don't even know if monk is the right name or leader, Tibetan leader. He's like a really well-respected person in, um, in the community. And, um, I didn't know anything about him. I went in very naively and there's just like a line of hundreds of people and you go up and he gives you a little red string and shakes your hand. And I was with some friends and, um, went up to get my string and and shook his hand. And when he shook my hand, I felt uh, like a lightning bolt went through my body. It was like everything went black for a moment. Um, I never experienced anything like that. I was really surprised. I was kind of an autopilot when I went up to meet him. And then that night I had really, really strong dreams. Um, I still remember them. I had a dream of a snake standing on its tail and saying oneness over and over again. And the next morning I kind of had my like um, (laughs) self, (laughs) I don't know, self uh, designed schedule. I would every day I'd go study um, yoga for three hours in the morning. And then in the afternoon, I'd see my teacher and study Lamo. And then uh, at four o'clock, I would meditate. And while we were in yoga class, the teacher was lecturing that day on oneness, on this idea of oneness. And I was like, this is so wild. Um, And I went to see my teacher later in the day, my Tibetan opera singing teacher. And I said, hey, I went to see the Karmapa yesterday. He said, oh, how are your dreams? (laughs) It's like, actually quite intense. I was at this point, I was, I felt like I was tripping a bit. Um, And he was like, yeah, it's it's not an uncommon experience to meet the Karmapa and and have some sort of dreams that guide you. And he, you know, he shared some stories with me that happened in the, within the community there after getting like blessings from the Karmapa or the Dalai Lama. And then I went to go do my daily meditation at four o'clock and I was having this really hard like back pain that was coming up that felt like fire. And usually I just kind of adjust my position to make it go away. But I was like, you know what, today I'm going to sit with this because this day is, this is an important day in my life. And I just sat through it and I sat through the sensations of things burning. And I guess a personal thing I can share is that I had um, polycystic ovaries. So polycystic ovarian syndrome, And I felt all this heat in the areas of my ovaries. And um, after that day, like all the symptoms I'd ever had of having polycystic ovarian syndrome just disappeared. It felt like the, like the sensation I had was like a things burning up and ashing up and dissolving. And um, yeah, I don't identify with that anymore. Wow. (laughs) Yeah. So that was quite a mystical experience that I had. Yeah. You seem very in touch with your inner wisdom, your intuition. How how does one let that guide them? What's coming to me is like, you have to self-betray yourself so many times (laughs) and realize that you you should not do that. (laughs) Yeah, like I, I, I struggled to get to this point of trusting my intuition. And I think the music business was like a really hard teacher for me of in various moments, following other people's advice or going against myself and yeah, being in this field of what I would say, self-betrayal and being like, it's not, it doesn't work. Every time I do that, I lose my way. Um, And so I've learned the hard way to really trust my instincts. (laughs) I think everyone is, has really amazing intuition and we just uh, have learned to trust other people over ourselves. Does meditation and those types of practices keep you connected with that? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I definitely, it's, yeah, I think, I think you're right to point to that. Like it's, it's certainly a relationship you cultivate. And I think when I'm spending lots of time in nature, it's stronger. Um, daily meditation practice really helps a hundred percent. It's like an important part of that. How long have you been involved with the retreats, I guess, or we wouldn't call them retreats, but I guess what would be the right word for uh, these types of things that we experience together? Ceremonies. Yeah, or... like plant medicine work, ceremonies. Yeah, yeah. plant medicine. Yeah. Uh, I've been personally 
plant medicine ceremonies. I've I've been working like as a participant. I mean, I've been on my own journey with plant medicines for um, probably about 12 years now. And then more on the facilitation side through music uh, within it's that's been about three, three years, a little over three years. And I'm going to get share because I know you're going to, you're going to pull some things out of me here. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm really curious about yeah, your own experience. <laughs> I know you're like, stop, let's stop asking me questions, dude. <laughs> but I can't help myself. Gonzo time. <laughs> I wanted to hear a bit about your personal experience. Like how, how did it, how did mm-hmm. working with plant medicine change your life? Oh my God. In so many ways. I mean, I think like if you met me before working with plant medicine, you'd be meeting a very different version of me. Yeah. That's probably the most real thing I can say. I, I had a very strong mind. I came from a really like cerebral background and I was not a real, truly embodied person, even though I was trying through all these practices to become more embodied. It was like, I knew that I had to do that, but I didn't know exactly why. And working with plant medicine put me directly into contact with everything I was avoiding my whole life which was like ultimately the path to becoming more at ease in the world. I know it's, it's hard because there's so many lessons and it's all integrated into your life. But I mean, is there a one or two sort of that you you can share that's kind of like always keeps coming up like almost daily for you that, that either you lean on or that's just something that's really stuck with you. One is just like how deeply connected I feel to nature now. And you know, protective on a different level, but also like aware that plants have their own consciousness that, you know, moving from an extractive mentality towards nature to really like mother nature is an heirloom. Like it's an alive being. I can call on the plants that I've worked with to support me in my daily life just through honestly, like mentally calling on them, which is a a big leap for a lot of people to take who've never worked in these modalities to be like, you can just call on plants for support. But I really feel that way when I'm moving through life. And um, yeah, just understanding how integrated that connection is. And, um, And I think like the other big change I would say is like just how humbling working with plant medicine is like it's it humbles us and that's the best thing we need uh to be in touch with our humanity it's like the culture of individualism that we're in and it's the self-serving nature of, of what we've been set up to believe and the plants show us like a different way of connecting a way of really living with a mystery living in the truth that we none of us know we're just like kind of as you know the ram das quote walking each other home um but that we're all deeply interconnected and understanding like our shared interconnectedness and entanglements on like a really profound level that if you understand that, then you just naturally become more compassionate and wanting to be of service because you're like our liberation and our suffering is deeply bound up within one another. You've been on both sides working with it yourself. And then as you mentioned the last few years, what would you call your role in these ceremonies? I call facilitator. I say I I, am. support port the ceremonies through music. I don't, I'm doing the work, but I'm like, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm in support of the plants who are doing the real work. <laughs> okay. I mean, it sounds like such an understatement to me. I need to describe to people because it's like, Oh, I support the ceremony <laughs> through the music. It's like, you guys can't understand what that means if you haven't done this before. Well, I mean, I've only had the pleasure of doing it with the, with the facilitators that we had there and your voice Sonia. Um, I mean, just carry me through so many moments. What a gift. The statement of, of like the def- the word definition of that and the reality of like what the music is doing for the facilitation of this experience. I can talk about a bit about my experience in a minute. And, yes. And kind of like maybe we can <laughs> give it a little back and forth. Yeah. One more question on, on, the, on the kind of the facilitator side. I'm just trying to paint the picture because you've seen, you've had your own experiences and, and you described what that opened up for you. What are some of the other things you've seen open up for other people as as a witness, as a facilitator? Mm. Oh, wow. Um, I mean, so many, so many beautiful things. It's like truly the privilege of my life to witness these kinds of transformations. But I think a big one, I think a lot of people come 
with um, depression, anxiety. And I, I do see that over long periods of time when people are working with plant medicines, that those things become a lot lessened. Um, uh, I think you have the experience so often in these journeys of connecting to something that's much greater than yourself and connecting to spirit, whatever that is. And if you haven't had a tangible experience of that in your life, if you think the material world is exactly as it appears to you, then you're going to move through life with a probably a, a deep, like a clenched sense of anxiety. <laughs> but I think once you have a taste of it, of like, wow, that this existence is so much more expansive than meets the eye there's almost like a deep bodily exhale that happens. I've seen people uh, work through ancestral trauma. I've seen people process um, childhood trauma. Um, I've seen people who have come in as you, as you saw too, within our container, but um, really, really difficult sleep issues um, and begin to get some relief from that different kind of like maybe physical things that have manifested as problematic that start to dissolve when you kind of work on this path. With these types of things, it's, I would say it's still considered, let's say alternative, right? I mean, sure. Definitely. Part of this is just, it's not to tell people, Oh, you should or shouldn't do this. It's really just about sharing the experience, maybe some education around what this is. And I guess when you get into like alternative spaces like this, you know, it can be perceived with skepticism, let's say, or just maybe it's like, oh, that's, you know, that's not something I'd ever do. That's not me. How do you describe this for, to, to some, not that you have to describe it to a skeptic, but how do you explain what's going on? I feel like this is the rebeginning, let's call it of a movement in some ways, at least there, there's a lot of science going into this and it got like put on pause. And I'd say the general history is that, you know, a lot of these hallucinogenic drugs got listed as, you know, schedule, was it schedule A or schedule C or whatever, whatever the the government wanted to outlaw and throw people in jail for. And then like basically all the scientific research behind it was sort of shut down for like, so basically there's like a generation of lost science on this stuff. And now it seems that a lot of people are getting back in. There's research studies being done. And I know Beckley is doing their own research and, and it's, it's more than just a bunch of people getting together and doing this. It's there's, there's also a lot of research happening on the science side. So I'm no expert, but I just wanted to hear a bit about how you explain this to people that are like, you know, I don't know. Is that a thing? Like the the work is going to keep like, it's like self-promoting, you know, people experience you one way before going on these journeys and then after, and they start getting curious I myself was somebody who said I was never going to try plant medicine. And then um, a situation presented in my life that I was not able to work through with my normal modalities. And I was like, I'll try anything. (laughs) And and I think there's a lot of people who reach that point in their life, whether it's um, detaching from something, whether it's like a grief, whether it is anxiety or some, um, you know, these, these deeper complexes we're, we're seeking relief from, and we've tried it and we've tried our best and we haven't been able to get there. And, um, so I think a lot of times what, um, encourages people to take that leap over their skepticism is, uh, reaching a breaking point where they'll try anything. And then also seeing the people around them who have had these experiences and seem to be happier or, at least um, altered in some way, in some positive way, hopefully um, by the experiences of sitting in ceremony and working with sacred plants. I will say that I feel it was life changing. How many things can you say that about? <laughs> you know, <it's> like, <laughs> and I'm really happy to hear you say that. I mean, I'm, I'm so happy and I'm, let's get into it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You're like, uh, stop. Stop asking me questions, <laughs> podcast dude. No. <laughs> well, first of all, I just you know, I know we we thanked you guys so so many times, and I hope that you felt the the love we were feeling for you all as as the facilitators guiding us through this. And and just to kind of let everybody know, I mean, we were doing this all as a group, so we had other aspects of this treat like breath work and meditation and these things. I I don't want to just like push these things to the side because they were to me very important. The whole experience was important. 
because the breath work for me, and if you want to do like, I don't know if you call it psychedelics light, but if you want to have like a, a experience, a really powerful experience without ingesting anything, I'd say like try breath work. For me, the breath work part was the cleansing that allowed me to go into the ceremony to, for me, that was, that was a part of the cleansing. And then, and then I felt like after I got through that, it was much more, I was much more ready, I guess, to tackle, tackle the ceremony. The, I'll, I'll just point out a couple things that I, I really loved. And I just want to say thank, thank you again for all the work you guys did and taking such good care of us and taking us through this journey. The ceremony itself was, was really beautiful. I, I didn't really know what to expect, but um, sort of the, the rituals surrounding the, the opening and the closing, the, the words that were said, and, and of course the music throughout that you all provided, all of those things set the, like you guys kept using the word, the container or the space for everybody to have their experience, which was super important. And another thing I really loved about the whole week was that, because you know, on the outside and, and I know <laughs> my mom was kind of like maybe half joking, like, is this like a cult? Are you going to like join a cult or something? You know, it's like, so I was sending her these joking texts. I'm like, Hey, we're going, we're all going to the South Pacific to wait for the aliens, you know? And I was just like, uh, <laughs> I, was just like I shouldn't do this. My poor mother, she's listening to this right now. I'm sure but she's curious as well. I would say the, the overall philosophy was that Everybody has their own individual journey and their own inner wisdom to kind of figure things out. So it wasn't about telling us what to do or teaching us certain things. I mean, there were certain techniques like breathing and things like that, but that was more, again, teaching us things for ourselves to like maybe calm our own bodies down or get insights from ourselves. And of course, the exercises and, and the sort of the group talks and, and the small group sessions and things like that, where there were just really you're all creating these opportunities to share, to connect, to talk, and a, and a sort of a safe space, I'd say, to, to be open. And so, I mean, you can't just, we're kind of going to talk about the ceremony, of course, but I just, I guess I just want to start there because you can't just like separate that out from everything else because it was the entire retreat experience that it's one cohesive thing. Yeah, for sure. And I think, you know, if you have the opportunity to experience this in like a yeah, multi-day container. It is um, just such a privilege to be sitting and having the kind of preparation and the holding. Is, it's a great way to go into the work. Yeah, and something interesting you said that stuck with me. Well, there, were, there were a few things. There were many things I should say, but you said uh, you kind of wanted to acknowledge the group and say it's it's great that everybody's here because this exploring a way to, I say, explore yourself. These aren't your exact words in a way that wasn't modeled for us growing up. I mean, this is, like we said, this is all pretty relatively newish, let's call it in some way. It's, it's not like, you know, going to the, to your local doctor, which everybody's just like a normal sort of accepted thing. This is a different kind of thing. Again, not comparing it to medical science, but I don't know. What do you want to know? <laughs> I don't know where to start. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, so, um, <laughs> it, okay. This is new for me too, to be on this side. This is fun. Um, I guess I'm curious, Jason, like what you're now a few days out of this experience. Are we a week out already? Yeah. Or? Yeah. Just about a week. And what do you, yeah. What are you noticing? What's, what's it been like for you coming home and getting to yeah process everything? The advice that you all shared was so spot on because it, you kept saying, you know, when you come home, if you're able to, don't plan anything. If you're able to avoid kind of being just like right back into your daily routine, and you can give yourself some space, East Coast old school guy. I'm like, oh, I'm sure I'll be fine. You know, <laughs> okay, <laughs> I got, I, I got it. You know, if I fall down when I was a kid, it's like you're okay, get up. You know, it's like all right. My family was away for the weekend, and I love them. I couldn't wait to see them, but boy, was I grateful that they were gone <laughs> because I have a four year old and a seven year old. It's full on, like the second you walk in the door when you come back from from a trip, and it's wonderful. You know, I felt so raw. I don't really know any other way to kind of say you. Somebody was describing it as like a peeled orange feel, but felt very sensitive to the world. The connection to nature was a similar experience to you. Just feeling so connected. I needed to be outside almost at all times. Like I had to be. I needed to be. I went on 
a long walk through the forest. Well, first of all, I first night bag was just kind of weird. And then I had this dream where <laughs> this is going to sound so strange. My dad has a guitar, but he doesn't really play guitar. A younger version of my dad showed up and like played this song, which I sent you. And then I, I woke up and wrote it like within like 10 minutes. I was like, that was weird. Like that never happened. And then I spent the whole day just outside. I just needed to be out in nature. I couldn't handle screens. I needed to write a lot, you know, just like I need to journal something every day and just kind of get my thoughts out. I just wanted to get down some of the experiences and and lessons I feel I'm starting to pull out of it before too much time goes by, you know, and I had this opportunity. So I just couldn't do anything but really take everything really slow. You know, it sounds odd probably, but I needed to just be out and slow. Yeah, there's so much medicine in slowness, right? Like we are moving so fast. We're moving so fast. So like the needing to take things slow just sounds really, I don't know, to me, it sounds really balanced. Was I slowing down or is this just like the way it should be all the time in a way? <laughs> I, and that's a question. You're shaking your head like, yeah, maybe that's something to think about. And, and it is. And, you know, I felt very definitely a different energy throughout my body. And this is where we can get into like, because one of the things you asked me before we were getting on this call a couple of days ago was like, what are some of the lingering questions? And, and this might be one of them. But I feel like I have the ability now, not even the ability, I just am more in the flow of life and serendipity. And I've always been open to those things, but it just feels more natural. I guess it just feels effortless in a way. Yeah, I think that this is like a very common experience of feeling in the flow of life. Sometimes after working with these plants and remembering how to be in the flow of life. Yeah, I wanted to ask you like what kind of insights you've had or any personal insights that have come through. I mentioned kind of the cleansing through the breath work. So I'll just share that the first, because that's when I did my crying. I did my crying during the breath work. Some people did their crying during the, the <laughs> ceremony on the mushrooms. Uh, I did my crying during the breath work. So the first one was really about trying to let go of some, what I feel is unnecessary anger that can arise. The first breath work session going into the first ceremony. And the second one was about releasing what I would call, I guess, ancestral anxiety. You know, talked about this in the group, basically, like uh, the fact that we can have anxiety that can be passed down because other people maybe didn't have the opportunity to work on these things. And I have an opportunity to work on this and also to maybe let go of some of that. And this goes into my lingering questions thing, which I'll get to in a minute, but okay. definitely feel like some of that got flushed out prior to these ceremonies setting me up for, I guess, a really a real openness when it came to the ceremony itself. Another thing, just doing the yoga and the breath work and connecting with other humans and, and all that stuff, I think was just uh, another takeaway is just being more in the body, in my body, like really in my body. I used to do a lot of physical work. And then uh, some years ago, I got into on a lot of online work for a lot of reasons. One, because I could work from anywhere and travel around. So it could allow me to that freedom and to make a podcast like this and be able to put it out and share ideas and, and, and make an impact and all that kind of stuff. So there are many benefits. I'm not poo-pooing it, but because I got away from like the sort of the human face-to-face -face type stuff and the physical work and everything, I feel like, you know, you get a lot of energy from that. And we're, I mean, we're social animals, right? So I have the gift of this podcast. I can get so many new perspectives, have all these thoughtful, wonderful conversations, and, but it's always nice to connect with people in, in person, you know? I feel like my baseline for my daily sort of feeling of in my body was false. Like it's, it's not really a baseline to shoot for. It's, it's, it's below where it should be, you know? So healthiness, I guess, uh, health, I guess, of being more in the body, movement, being in nature, certainly helps that it's spring in Norway and the weather's absolutely gorgeous. So it makes it easier to go outside than when it's covered in ice. But, you know, this goes back to my lingering questions of 
how can I take these lessons learned? I just shared a few of them, but saying, uh, the buck can stop here. I don't have to carry this anxiety with me. Okay. But in those moments where I would feel it, how do I implement new habits to create lasting change in my life? And that's the big lingering question. And that's where a lot of the work comes in. This is what I really like about the program. You have like four weeks to prepare you. Then you have the retreat. Then you have the six week integration period afterwards. And so you're not just doing this thing and then you're just like, I'm just going to go on my life. Like we're actually trying to integrate these lessons into our lives. And that's part of the, the program, but also part of your, just your daily existence, you know, in those moments when they come up, it's like, how am I going to, I'm not that person anymore. And I don't want to be that person. And, but that person's still there, you know, (laughs) and you can feel them rising up that part of your personality, let's say, or whatever. It's unwelcomed. How do you then do the things you need to do to, I guess, really fully become the person that you know who you are? I just love that question too, because you know, you are, (laughs) And I think part of what you can trust is the fact that you're having this awareness of like, oh, this old personality, this part of my personality is presenting itself is already indicative that you've received some distance from it because you're not over identifying. You're not saying, I feel angry. You're like, oh, the the anger has risen. There's like a difference. It's kind of what we practice in meditation as opposed to being like, when you start witnessing your body reacting to things rather than saying, Oh, I I feel pain. You're like, Oh, there's pain in my body. You start seeing the mechanism as opposed to feeling it's a part of you. And I think that, um, that distance of observation can be really helpful. And then the integration process is starting to see when those moments are coming up and saying, okay, how am I going to respond differently in this moment than I've done in the past? And hopefully you could again, like call on your, your breath in certain moments <laughs> to help you regulate when we have those experiences in ceremonial contexts where we have to really call on our breath and see that our breath will help us get through and help us navigate complicated situations with more equanimity and peace. We can, those are transferable skills to our actual lives, of course. Yeah. Reconnecting with the breath was wonderful. You, you, so many nice guided meditations, which uh, actually you sent us a link to where you can get some of those. So if you want to grab them, we'll link up to those. I don't want to bury the headline or sell people short because uh, I was always curious about, all right, but what about like the actual psychedelic experience? Like what are some of the things that happened? And I've always, this is one of the things that made me very curious. It's like, well, what do you mean? How did you, how could you have experienced that? What you were saying kind of brought this up because I feel like one of the one of the things I noticed during the psychedelic experience was that the other parts of you are very clear and distinct and noticeable, let's say, from the, how would you describe yourself? The pure consciousness of you, which is no you, because at one point I did, I uh, became different things. I became part of the plant ecosystem. Mm-hmm. It's going to sound really weird to people, but (laughs) there was a, my arm, my arm kind of was a tree root. And then all of a sudden I was in the ground with the dirt as part of the plant ecosystem being cradled by mother nature. I, I know it sounds, there's a reason why people use the adjective trippy folks. I know it sounds trippy. (laughs) (laughs) I just remember when I woke up next to one of the participants or not woke up, but you know, we had, we had blindfolds on, but you could take them off. But a lot of this is about an inner journey. So I'm just kind of describing the experience to people and it lasted some hours. But you know, when we were sort of at the tail end and the ceremony ended, my next door neighbor there on on the bed looked up and said, uh, well, that that's not for the faint of heart. <laughs> There's a reason why they call it a trip, I guess. But yeah, being a part of the the plant ecosystem and then really just kind of disappearing where there was no me. I remember having to come out and be like, but I'm me. Like I have children. I have like a family. I have friends and people that I love. Like I don't want to disappear. And then 
I was like, uh, trusting just, okay, you guys promised this was a round trip ticket and that we're all coming back. So let me just go with this. And then just, just went away. And, you know, that was powerful. I remember having the blindfold off at a point and just a couple of times in both ceremonies and being able to look out at the trees and seeing so much beauty and just every single little patch that I would stare at. And, but it was the kind of beauty where I can only describe it as pure bliss mode, let's say, because it wasn't like, I wasn't labeling the beauty. I wasn't saying here is this adjective beauty. And now here's my construct of this adjective. And, and this matches my construct of this adjective. It just was with no description needed. Wow. You know, I have my own ideas, but I'm curious, like, why is it a valuable experience to connect to the no thingness or connect to the beauty or connect to this space that is beyond personality? For me, there were several benefits, but I could say what's coming to mind, one of the big ones is that it's it's one thing to intellectually believe and have these values of we're all one. And you know, this is, I'm speaking for myself here. And these are things that I believed going into this, you know, and, and that we're all connected and, and, and this sort of thing. But then to have a visceral experience that actually connects you with everything in a way that I can't really describe, you just realize it on a soul level, let's say. It's really hard to put into words. And that, that is life changing. And also, you know, being buried at my own funeral when you were singing Leonard Cohen's Hallelujah, and everything was peaking. <laughs> that was pretty, pretty wild too. <laughs> that kind of ties in with another, you know, one, <laughs> yes, whatever you got going on up there, it's like, yeah, you're like, I wonder how this is hitting people, what, what they're going through right now. That quick experience I shared, you know, there's a common thing that I've read that people that go through this, one of the things they can experience, one of the effects so that we can call it afterwards, is that it decreases or eliminates fear of death. Now, I'm not going to say I'm never going to be afraid of like dying again, but I can be like the type of guy that has like a mini existential crisis like every other week, you know? Not like a meltdown, but just like, I think about death a lot, like in a good way, as a motivator. Like, let me appreciate these moments. Like, we're all going to, you know, we're not, it's not going to be forever. But then sometimes that can also be I create a layer of stress, right? Because you can just worry like, oh, this could all go away, you know, and like this grasping. Having an experience of uh, being at peace while life is going on above you and being in the ground at, and at peace and just connected in that way and like it was just all good. I think it did something around my, f- let's call it like whatever fears of death that I had that may be coming up at times. It really... I don't want to say eliminated that, but it, it did something that caused that to shift in a positive way, let's say. Yeah, big time. And I, you know, I was going to mention it earlier when you asked me the big changes and I, I don't know why I held back on it, um, but I'm so grateful that you named it because I do think that that's one of the biggest things that I've personally received from this work and that a lot of people do is uh, it's kind of lingering there all the time, whether or not you acknowledge it is what's death going to be like and the anxiety around that or whatever your experience is around that. And I do feel that this work helps people get in touch with that in a way that um, takes away some of the fear. It's only my experience, but I heard this from other participants. It's like you knew what to sing or what to do and when, and when to beat the drum and when to sort of create the waves of music that we needed to ride through the experience. How do you (laughs) energetically, how do you do that? How do you do that? I know you can't be like, well, here's what I do. Step one, you know, (laughs) is there a thought process or is it just pure, like in the moment, like this is just the next thing. And how does that work? Yeah. There's definitely no set list, (laughs) you know, at at the beginning, (laughs) maybe in the beginning, there's a set list. I, you know, I sing some protection songs for the space, but otherwise um, it's really attunement, like looking at the room and seeing what song needs to come through. What does the room need right now? If the energy is feeling stagnant or stuck, getting on a drum, if we're feeling, yeah, somebody's, 
there are certain songs that I think help people uh, surrender to the experience more if that's something that's not happening. Um, but there's just also a bit of the spontaneous, like trusting in the emergence of the whole thing. And it's very chicken and egg of like what, who's leading who <laughs> is the music guiding the experience is the mushroom guiding experience is the people, you know, we're responding to, to you. We're definitely responding to you for sure. A funny joke I just remembered that I made to myself when I was <laughs> <laughs> in the middle of the whole psychedelic experience. Cause there was one moment where you guys went silent and it, it lasted a really long time. It was a longer than average silence. Right. Yes. And I said to myself, Oh, I got, <laughs> I sound like Beavis and Butthead. I was like, Oh, I got to add silence. I got to add silence to the set list. <laughs> Very important. Why. I found that very amusing for myself. I was like, yeah, silence has got to be on the set list. So uh, there you go. It's now uh, one of my favorite tracks on the set list. Can you talk about the two songs we're hearing today a bit? All My Life is a Ceremony and Divine Surrendering, which was always magical when it, when it came through. Mm. Both of them. Yeah. Can you share a little bit about those songs? Sure. Um, All My Life is a Ceremony is a song that I kind of carried the lyrics to for like nine years before they became a song. I actually heard them in a ceremony that I was in, in my, as a participant, one of my own integration circles, there was this wonderful woman who was sharing about her experience. And she said, you know, I realized last night that my whole life is a ceremony, that every moment is a ceremony and that all these difficult experiences I go through are just these like, uh, you know, initiations into greater intimacy with life when I zoom out. And I was like, at some point I'm going to make that a song. I don't know when. <laughs> and I, I think I needed to go on my own journey more to understand how to let that wisdom kind of like settle into my system and get metabolized into song. But, um, yeah, I finally released a collection of my my own medicine songs about it's just last summer, I guess. Yeah. Last June 2022. And then Divine Surrendering. That yeah, that was one of those heaven sent songs that I can't even really claim. Like I uh was passing through something personally that was really difficult and sat down with my friend Devin one day at the piano and that song came through in like 10 minutes. <laughs> it's like wow yeah really? yeah it's like i didn't write that song um but that song has been so that's the best it's the best it's, it's not about me you know it's just like you that turn the, you turn the frequency on the antenna and you just tap into the universe for a second um and that song's been probably the most game-changing song of my life because people write to me all the time and are like i gave birth to your song um, I listened to it 20 times while I was doing my own ceremony. Like it just seems like it's holding space for, um, a lot of really important moments, which is, you know, just a dream as a songwriter and musician. So yeah, must feel so good. Yeah. Yeah. I received a lot from, from the, from both of those songs. Yeah. Well, I'm excited that you gave us the chance to share them here and you'll have to, Go follow Do Paro. Hopefully I'm still pronouncing it right. You got it. <laughs> and, and check these out because they are powerful songs. And uh, yeah, I mean, the closest I can get to, one of the closest ways I get to spirits, let's say, in a daily life is, is through songwriting and creative expression. When you go into those modes where you're just like, you can kind of disappear and time is all wacky and stuff. That's a gift to have something like that in your life, I think. Well, thank you. I'm sorry. I hope I didn't steal too much of your time here. It's a pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> so fun. We got into it, but I really do appreciate your, your wisdom throughout the week and your guidance and everybody's that was involved. Just super helpful for us to come through. And I will say that most of us didn't have ex these types of experiences before going in. So this wasn't a group that like they had all done this before. So 
you know, even more important to kind of like with the prep and the conversations and, and all that stuff, you know, I know it wasn't your, your guys' first rodeo, so <laughs> you handled us well. You were angels. So thank you. Thank you, Jason. Thank you so much. And I look forward to staying in touch. Yeah. Big time. Keep me posted. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. There you have it. Thanks once again to the team at Beckley Retreats. And if you are interested in what they have to do, I have a link for you. Zero to travel.com slash Beckley, B E C K L E Y. You can sign up for their newsletter. You can get more information about the programs. And being a Zero to Travel listener, they're offering a $200 credit if you decide that this is something you want to do again. You have to do your own due diligence. Remember the disclaimers at the top. But they were kind enough to hook you up as a listener of this show. So zero to travel.com slash Beckley, B-E-C-K-L-E-Y. And if you'd like to get more information, you can do that over there. You might have been hoping for some audio from the ground. I was hoping to do that as well. I wanted to take some audio during the ceremonies and give you a sense of the music and the room and the environment. But understandably, I couldn't take any audio because we were in a group setting, and that's for the privacy and the protection of the group. And that was a magical group. If anybody from that group is listening, thank you so much. It's always amazing to me when a group of people come together that'll probably never come together again, and magic comes out of that. They just gel, and there's some kind of special thing happening, and and it just happens right there in real time. And you know this group of people will never be together again. You've probably experienced this through your own travels. Maybe you've met people at a hostel or you've been solo traveling and just you know randomly met people here or there. And you come together and you have these magical days together. And that was a big part of this. So well, just a lovely experience all around. And I mentioned at the top, I would share one of the things I'm most proud of. And I think my biggest concern from the ceremony perspective from the actual taking of psilocybin mushrooms was having the bad trip. That's everybody's fear, right? And not being able to let go and just go on the journey. And for the most part, I was able to let go. And that feels really good because a lot of things in our life are always very scheduled out and and controlled. And I'm an open-minded person, of course, but, you know, in the moment when some intense experiences are happening, I wondered if I'd be able to just let go and let let sort of what's supposed to happen happen. And even if that was maybe scary at times, uh, where there were a couple times where it got a little, okay, this is, uh, this is unexpected <laughs> type of thing. But I was able to just let go and go on the ride. And I'm really proud of myself for doing that. And I think you know, letting go in that setting has translated to yeah, trying to just let go more in my daily life and still processing these lessons, still implementing these changes. And I'll probably have more to share about this in future episodes. But for now, this is where we're at and I'm feeling good. And I want to thank you for listening. I'm going to leave you with a quote and then please stick around for a little bit of Do Paro. You heard us talk about her song, Divine Surrendering. What a lovely voice. I can't say enough about it. And I want to play a little clip from that song so you get the vibe of it and you can hear what we were hearing during our ceremony. And that was just such a lovely song to hear, all of her singing and all the singing of the facilitators. Such a beautiful experience. And I will link up to her artist page on Spotify. She's got some guided meditations and all kinds of cool stuff. All of that is in the show notes. So I'll leave you with a quote. Then you can hear Divine Surrendering. This quote I heard a few times during the retreat, and I love it. It's from Ram Das, who said, we're all just walking each other home. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you next time. Peace and love to you and yours. Cheers. Dark.
are crawling till I walk Each time that I fall deep I remember it Holding on too tight Trying till I might Tired from the fight Deep I surrender it Deep I surrender This podcast has been brought to you by zerototravel.com.